Good morning. Would you stand with us today? Are you ready to praise the Lord? It's a beautiful day out there, isn't it? It's been a rainy week, but the sun is shining. And uh, we're glad to be together in the house of the Lord. Amen. Let's give God praise. Let's sing with us. Great are you, Lord. Great are you, Lord, mighty and strength. You are faithful.
a mighty God. He is the creator of all things, the sustainer of all things. He designed each and every one of us, every flower, every star, every cloud, every blade of grass belongs to him. That's the God that we serve. But thanks to Jesus Christ, his son, we have access to his very throne room. We have access to the presence of God. Do you believe that God is in this place today with us right here? He is here. Amen. So I want to encourage you today to lift your hands in surrender, in openness to God, that his Holy Spirit could come into your heart and transform you. We believe that he is always working in our lives. He is always speaking to us. He is comforting us, guiding us, healing us, giving us everything we need. And he is here today. So let's worship him. You are here, moving in our midst. I worship you. I worship you.
worship the Lord today. Just lift your voice to him. Tell him how much you love him. When we look back over our lives, we realize just how much God has done over the years. We see all the things that he's done in our lives, and it just blows our minds sometimes. But right now in the moment, many times we don't see it. We don't know what God is doing. We don't understand. We're going through hard times. We're going through difficulties. And we question God and his sovereignty because it hurts, because it doesn't make sense. But that's what our faith is all about, trusting him no matter what. If we believe that our God is sovereign, then every hardship, every struggle is counted a blessing because we know that it's part of making us who he wants us to be. It's part of forming us into his image. And we are so thankful that he's given us the gift of the Holy Spirit to help open our eyes to his word, to help us to see what is going on all around us. But there is a spiritual realm that we just can't even begin to tap into. There is a spiritual realm where angels and demons and our enemy, the devil, is prowling around seeking to devour us. But Jesus Christ has already won the victory over the devil because he died on a cross 2,000 years ago to save us from our sins. And there's nothing the devil can do to take that away from us. Amen. That's worth praising God for. Good morning, Cross Community Church. My name is Annika Schmidt, um, and I just want to welcome everyone here this morning. Um, and to everyone joining us online, welcome. Um, it's so good to have you here. 
Uh, if you are new with us, we are so glad that you're here. Can we just give everyone who's new a big welcome today? If you are new, I'd like to encourage you to take just a moment to fill out one of our InTouch cards. It's located in the seat back pocket in front of you. If you just fill that out and then you can drop it off at the end of service on your way out, our ushers will be holding baskets where you can just put that in there. Giving is an act of worship. You have many ways that we can give this morning. Right now, we're not passing around the offering basket just in order to minimize contact. So instead, you can drop up your offering at the end of service on your way out. Our ushers will be holding baskets at the doors. You can also give electronically. If you have a Venmo account, you can give right now on your phone with the Venmo app. Just find us at Cross Community Church. You can also give on our website. Just go to crosscommunity.cc and click the Giving tab. This upcoming Wednesday evening, July 29th at 7 p.m., we will be having our midweek church-wide service. This event will be one hour, and it will be in the worship center. It will be filled with praise and worship, a time for prayer, a special presentation from our cross kids, and a short word from Pastor Randy. All of our community life groups, the Emerge Youth Group, and the elementary kids aged age kids will be in attendance. I just wanted to share a verse real quick about um, worshiping with multiple generations. It's from Psalm 145, verse 4, which says, One generation shall commend your works to another and shall declare your mighty acts. It's so important that we gather together every age to worship God. So I would encourage you, bring the whole family. Um, there will be child care for kids four years old and younger. Um, it's in the worship center at 7 p.m. During the month of July, we have been partnering with the local non-for-profit First Care in our baby bottle boomerang. If you have already picked up a bottle and returned it, thank you so much. For those of you who would still like to participate, you still have one week left, so make sure you grab your bottle today and bring it back um, with filled with all of your cash and change and drop it off no later than next Sunday, August 2nd. 100% um, of those proceeds will be going to First Care Women's Clinic and will help expectant women in need. Missions are an important part of who we are as a church. We partner with missionaries around the globe, both prayerfully and financially. These past few weeks, we have been hearing from some of these missionary families. So now, if you would, please turn your attention to the screen for a short video from our very own Bishop Alex Abiola as he shares an update on the mission's work he has been overseeing in Nigeria. Thank you so much, uh, Cross Community, Pastor Randy, and I thank God for the support that you've been giving to us uh, in Nigeria and all over the West Africa that I'm working in. Um, the country has been shut down. All of our countries are Nigeria, Ghana, Liberia, Sierra Leone, Cameroon, and Gambia that I work in. So I've been here since uh, March. Uh, in Nigeria, the two pastors that were supporting, Pastor uh, Samson and Pastor Noah, they are doing well. Uh, unfortunately, Pastor Samson uh, lost uh, another pregnancy. They've been married for about five years now. They have had two miscarriages, so just keep them in prayer. But the work that we're doing with them is still looking good. They are continue to build the school that we're helping them to build. Uh, in uh, Nigeria, the church keep on go growing, even in the midst of this. One of the things that I want to say is, I thank God that we're still alive. And I thank God that every situation, God has control over it because we belong to him. And the work of the Lord will continue to move forward. So I want to say this time, uh, take this time again to say thank you. Thank you for your support. The Lord bless you and keep you. We love you. Keep praying for us. I will pray for you. And may the Lord bless you. Thank you so much. Bye. Every time I try to make it on my own Every time I try to stand and start to 
All these lonely roads that I have traveled on There was Jesus When the life I built came crashing to the ground When the friends I had were nowhere to be found Well, I couldn't see it then, but I can see it now There was Jesus In the waiting, in the search, in the healing and the hurting Like a blessing buried in the broken Let's give them another big hand, shall we, please? I'm not afraid of these people, brother, so I'm going to get a little closer to them and uh, praise God, bring God's word. Good morning. Uh, as we begin, I am Pastor George Ray, and I'm just pinch hitting for Pastor Randy, who will be here on Wednesday night, and then again uh, next Sunday, he and his family are taking a well-deserved break, so pray for them. Now, as we begin, in order to honor those who come from liturgical backgrounds, are there people in here who come from liturgical backgrounds? Is there anybody? Oh, come on. All right, so we're going to do a little liturgy. Just stay where you are. Just repeat after me. This is the day. day. Say it like you mean it. This is the day that the Lord hath made, I will rejoice and be glad in it. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you filled with gladness? You should because God is in the house. There's an old, old story about a man who lost his job, and he went through the local paper and found out that the city zoo was hiring people. And so 
he ran down there, of course, and applied, and the manager looked at him and said, yeah, we have lots of openings. He said, but uh, our gorilla just died. And uh, what I need is somebody to put on a gorilla suit and go and act like a gorilla. Uh, and the guy balked at that. He said, what kind of job is that? But because he had no money, he went ahead and he did it anyway. And so uh, after several days, the crowds grew, more people came. And so in order to just show off, he started getting on that rope and he was swinging and swinging. And all of a sudden, he swung right over the fence into the lion's den. And all of a sudden, he heard the lion approaching him and the steps coming closer and closer. And he turned around and there was the lion. And he started yelling, help, 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 in front of all of those people. And the lion came up closer to him and said, shut up, we're both gonna lose our jobs. <laughs> Things are never what they appear, are they? So I wanna share with you just my perceptions about what God is doing today. Uh, I've heard some sermons about this, but I'm just going to share with you what I think God is up to. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to talk about it in terms of the world or this nation or even the larger church, but I am going to talk in terms of it in our individual uh, lives. Many physical objects, of course, in the Bible uh, carry rich spiritual truths, and one of these objects helps explain I believe what is occurring in your life and in my life today. And the object that I want to focus on is a threshing floor, and that we will see through this process as we go through it and look at several different threshing floor experiences, we're going to see that God uses it for separating, uh, separating us from things in our lives that are inhibiting us from being fully and completely used by the Spirit of God to advance His kingdom. Some of those things are habits, hang-ups, uh, things that we do, some are sin, and yes, some are even people that hold us back from achieving the destiny that God has for us. So there's this idea of separation. And then God uses it for preparation, to prepare us for what is ahead. And God is doing that today because I don't know when this thing is going to end, but I do know that it could be something else right around the corner. For we are in an unusual season, and God is not going to leave his church. I don't, I don't get upset at me, but he's not going to leave his church in the cozy and comfortable position we all want to maintain. Just isn't going to do it. So you can say you heard it from here first. And then this last thing that God does at a threshing floor is consecration, which is a theological term which simply means dedication to God. Who are you dedicated to? Who are you yielded to? Who am I yielded to? Where is my dedication? Does it reflect in my choices? Does it reflect in my priorities? And so with that, let me just read uh, from 2 Samuel 24, uh, our scripture for the day, and then offer some understanding and context for it, and then off we go. How many of you brought your Bible today? Whoa! So I was in a church last Sunday, and I walked in, and I carried a Bible, and a lady came up to me, and she says, nobody brings their Bible to church anymore. And I said, what a shame. Uh, because this is the book that guides, leads, directs, counsels us, builds us up, gives us hope, uh, and gives us direction. And God bless you, ma'am. And may the Lord just touch you and heal you and inspire you. So thank you for bringing your Bible. Second Samuel 24. Okay, I see it's on the screen. Well, I'm going to read it from my Bible. And Gad, who was a prophet, 
came that day to David and blessed you again, and said to him, Go up and raise an altar to the Lord on the threshing floor of Arana. You may not have not heard that name pronounced that way. There are three or four different ways that you can pronounce it. I prefer Arana, the Jebusite. And so David went up at Gad's word as the Lord commanded. And when Arana looked down, he saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. And Arana went out and paid homage to the king with his face to the ground. And Arana said, why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, to buy the threshing floor from you in order to build an altar to the Lord that the plague may be averted from the people. Would you pray after me? Father, I just thank you for these moments that we at Cross Community have. I first thank you, Lord, that this assemblage has chosen to come here this morning. They had many options, many choices. But Lord, they chose you, and I thank you for that. Father, I am just a man, and Father, I ask you to forgive me for all my sins in my life. Put a right spirit within me. Give me a pure heart. I need an anointed tongue, because I am not capable of doing anything, O oh God, apart from you. So I ask for your help. I ask, Lord God, we would be transformed. I pray that you would give us insight and knowledge. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer, in Jesus' name, and all God's people said. So David, uh, took a census of the people of Israel. He was warned not to uh, by his advisors, but he went ahead anyway. He was motivated by those things that happen to people who have a lot of success in life like David did, and pride and arrogance snuck in and got the better of him. For a moment, he forgot that the battle is the Lord's. His accomplishments had been brought about by the hand of the living God, just as your have, yours have and mine have. It is the hand of God. All that we have, all that we are, comes from his throne of grace. All that America has comes from his throne of grace. Uh, and that is the goodness of God. And so the Lord des desired to punish him for this. And so what he did is David submitted himself to God and said, Lord, you do what you will do. And so what God does is in three days, he killed 70,000 men in Israel. 70,000 men in Israel. So what God does is he takes away from David that which he had pride in, took it away from him. And uh, as a result, God, after three days, wants to bring this to an end. And so he invites the prophet Gad to come and to bring David up to the threshing floor uh, of Arana. And David was summoned there. And I, if you have ever seen a picture of uh, Jerusalem, you always see the picture of the Dome of the Rock. Yes. Do, do you ever seen the picture of the Dome of the Rock? You know, you can talk back to me. I'm talking to you. I, I just need to have a little energy here. You know what I mean? So the Dome of the Rock was the uh, threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. It is in this place that Abraham had brought Isaac to sacrifice him, and God provided the ram. It is in this place, 2 Chronicles 5, 1, where Solomon will build the temple. Where is it built? On a threshing floor, on a place of sacrifice, on a place of separation. So David was summoned to this place. He purchased it in this threshing floor, becomes a place of absolute great significance in the eyes of God. So today, God is be just uh, bringing the world to the threshing floor. 
That's what's going on. He is bringing us not to harm or hurt or to injure, but I'll explain in a moment what he's trying to do. But he's trying to bring us back to himself, to bring back the divine order. Because what we are experiencing now in the world is a people, is a world who have walked away from God's divine design and his order. And the result is this, chaos and disorder. You say, why do we have it? Is it because of this group, that group? No, it's because people have forsaken the truths of God. That's what's going on. So if you uh, take you to Israel when you go with us, hopefully someday we'll be able to go back. A threshing floor, if we round it off the stage, it would be just a little bigger than this stage. And it would be a place that of hard packed clay or a little more fancier, they would have stones. And they would bring the wheat harvest, millet harvest, barley harvest. They would put it, scatter it out. And generally, uh, they would bring in a couple or three oxen and they would go around and around and they would tromp down the uh, grain. And the purpose, of course, was to separate separate the grain from the husks and from the stalks. That's the threshing part. Then they would take a winnowing fork and throw it up in the air, and that's why most threshing floors were on a high hill, so that the wind would carry the chaff, God bless you, carry it away. And then the final process was the sifting. The women would come with great big sifters. They would put the grain in the sifters, and then they would shake it. Ever been shaken in your life? I'm not talking about shake, rattle, and roll. I'm talking about events that God allows or permits. And they would shake it and remove the little particles and the little rocks. So that was the process. This is a process that we spiritually will go through many times in our lives. The more you will be used by God, the more you'll go through this. It's the the truth. It's just like building a skyscraper in New York City. If you build a skyscraper, you're not going to dig a 10-foot hole. It is going to be mammoth with mammoth steel and concrete so that the foundation can support the structure. So it is in our lives. If God intends to use you to the extent that he's going to use you, he will take you through this process for his glory. Uh, A process uh, that sometimes it's a little tough to take, as our friend Brian just said a few moments ago. But why does he do it? God doesn't do it to destroy us, because he delights in you. Your own family may not delight in you, but God delights in you. He cares for you. He wants you to win the race. He wants you to complete your destiny and the purpose for which he has brought you forth on this earth. To help you reach that place, given the gifts, the talents, the experiences, he wants them to come to fruition that you would be a blessing to others. He wants to make us godly influencers Influencers, that's the buzzword for the day. I don't know whether you followed that on social media, but now you know. So if some hipster comes up to you and says, what's the word, Jelly Bean? You can say influencers. God wants you to be a mighty influence for godliness, for truth, for holiness, for goodness, for care, for tenderness, for kindness, for gentleness, for love, for joy, for encouragement, for hope. That's what God wants. Yeah? Where am I going, honey? I'm just kidding. I'm just seeing if they're paying attention. To make us more valuable, God wants your life to be more valuable than it is. 
But there's some things that have got to go. Some things that have to be taken away. I've ministered quite often in homes of addiction. People, young men that are addicted to drugs and alcohol. Some things, I would always tell them, that have to go in order for you to go forward. And without this process of separation from the chaff, the harvest would not be beneficial. God wants your life to be beneficial. He wants you to be a fruit bearer. He wants you to bear a harvest. He wants you to be like that grain that is separated to be a feeding for the multitudes. He wants you to feed the people in your family truth and life and love. He wants you to feed the place where you work or the school that you attend. He wants the sweet aroma of Jesus Christ to permeate out of every pore of your being so that when people are with you, they don't want you to leave their presence. Would that be said about you? Well, one person, thank goodness, hallelujah. I want to see you after the service, thank you. Now, if I went and interviewed the grain, if I took the microphone, may I take this for a moment? It's off, right? I don't want to just get foolish. And I went up to the grain and say, Mr. Grain, how do you feel about being threshed? Ouch! How would you like two 1,500-pound oxen tromping on you and slobbering all over you with their saliva? It's not fun. It's hurtful, injurious. And as our friend Brian said earlier, these things sometimes we just don't understand. But God is, as you know, is working all things for our good and for our service and for our usefulness. And God has got to do that in the church today because the church, the larger church, uh, we have come to a point when we have forgotten the truth that inaction is not an option. We're the salt and the light. We're the hope of the world. You are wherever God places you. But there may be things that are stopping you. And there's some of them may be good. Some of them may be good things. God used the threshing floor to thresh out David's pride and arrogance, which would prevent him uh, from trusting in the Lord. When Trish and I began our ministry, we began in the nursery. Yep, that's true. Four little boys, and Trish and I were given some money to decorate the nursery in this new church that we attended in a suburb of Washington, D.C., and inevitably on my first day, you know what happened. The mom would come and she's got five bags hanging over her and hands you the bags. And then finally she hands you little Susan. <laughs> mommy, mommy, don't leave me. And so thus began our ministry. And what the little child was experiencing was separation anxiety, which if you read psychology today or the uh, psychology portion from the Mayo Clinic, you find out that separation anxiety should be over by most children in two years, by the age of two years. And they will tell you that this is a necessary part of their maturation and their growth their transformation to make them individuals, to make them separate, a part of the separation from their parents, begun at an early age, and it's beneficial for them. Now, there's some people that never get over that, and therefore they call it uh, separation anxiety disorder, okay? Becomes a disorder, a dysfunction that lingers with you for a long time. 
So my point is simply this. God separates things from our lives, and therefore we have to hold things loosely. Story of our son Mark, he was born eight weeks premature, almost said eight months, but I caught myself. Eight, <laughs> eight weeks premature, boarding uh, Walter Reed Army Medical Hospital there in Washington, D.C. He had every condition that would take his life that you could possibly name. He looked, his skin was mottled. He looked like a diamondback rattlesnake. I don't know if you've ever seen a child uh, whose, thin, uh, whose skin was so thin that it just showed all of these uh, uh, veins and arteries, etc. What happens is, is that Mark uh, was very, very ill, and we thought that thought he was going to die. So Trish and I are driving around the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and um, all of a sudden, uh, we got a phone call. The hospital said, quickly, can you come here? We said, we're on our way. So we said, that's it. So Trish and I, together, what we did is what people do in a nursery. We visually took Mark, and we put him in the hands of Jesus Christ. We said, Lord, we don't want to lose him, and we love him, but we're going to put him in your hands because he's your child. And then the rest of the way to the hospital, Trish and I squalled like two little babies. But as it turns out, when we got there, there was a doctor, and he said, Captain and Mrs. Ray, I have good news for you. We have found the problem that is taking the life of your son. And I said, praise the Lord, and we rejoice together. But I'm convinced that it is important that we are willing to say, Lord, it is yours. Lord, it is the career that you have given me. Lord, it is the house. It is the home. It is the children. It is the ministry. I surrender it to you. Not my will, but thy will be done. And that's where God is bringing us as a people to. Uh, I've had a recurring dream. Do you want to hear about my dream? I know we've got some psychologists in here. I'm a little worried. They may, they, may, they may say this is not really the correct interpretation, but I had this dream when we retired and it occurred about once a month, and finally it stopped because I think God has showed me what the problem was. And, and uh, so I would be in a commercial jet. I was the only person on the jet, right? And the funny thing is the plane would take off, but it never got above 50 feet off the ground. And occasionally the tips of the wing would hit trees. Or if we flew through a canyon, it would hit the side of the canyon and cause rocks to tumble. So after this happened three or four times, I said, why doesn't the pilot fly higher? Right? Makes sense. And so, Lord, I said, what is the meaning of this dream? And God just, it's a very simple thing. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, he brought me to Proverbs 12, 5. I was just reading. And it says, anxiety in a man's heart weighs him down. Anxiety and fear and fretting push you down. Push you down. And that's where Satan wants you. Do you see? That's where he wants you. He wants you pushed down. God wants you to soar as on wings of eagles. But the enemy wants to push you down. And I did not even realize until Trish said one day, George, you are filled with such anxiety. I said, I am? She said, you are, sweetheart. And there are several things that I had to bring to the attention of the Lord and repent of. But one of the things, you want to hear what it was? Does anybody want to hear that? Okay. <laughs> Thank you out there in television land for being willing to listen to this. What happened was, is that I have allowed myself to be influenced too much 
by the national news. And I've fretted about it, worried about it, and I am worried. I shouldn't be. And I need to release that because God says, George, listen, you're not in charge here. <laughs> George, you couldn't change anything even if you wanted to, except through prayer and moving my hand. Because I am concerned and it's weighing me down. And I had to once again go out and stand by the intercoastal and say, God, you are the omnipotent almighty everlasting God all kings and kingdoms submit to you you are in charge of all things all events even this nightmare that is occurring throughout the world you are Lord and there is none other oh Lord my Lord how majestic is your name in all the earth and that's what God wanted me to do is to start flying higher not to be pushed down uh, by the darkness of the world. And just parenthetically, let me share this. I, I have all these things in my head, so I got to get them out. Do you know how many people die every day in the world? Somebody take a guess. In the world, how many people die every day? Somebody take a guess. A million? No. Come on down. Six, seven thousand? Come on up. Come on up. 156,000 people in the world die every day. What if we put that on the front page of the Palm Beach Post? Today, 156,000 people die. Then tomorrow, 162,000 people die. It happens every day. Every day. But the news sometimes can be manipulated in such a way that it engenders fear in our lives. And the fear, not faith, controls us. We become controlled by a media rather than by the spirit of the living God. Now, I'm not talking about being foolish, taking off your mask and not cleaning your hands. We learned to wash our hands when I was five months old, maybe a little old. So these things happen in our lives. The human body, when does the human body grow? When we sleep, give yourself a hand. <laughs> when we sleep, when do we sleep? When it's dark, we sleep when it's dark generally. You follow me? So it is in these dark, difficult, adverse moments in our lives that we're actually, God is bringing new growth in our spirits and in our hearts. And so rather than being disturbed about it, we need to get our Bible and spike it uh, because God is doing something new and fresh in our lives. So if you've been praying, 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 God, open up a ministry, a door. Ask him, are there things that I need to get rid of? Paul did that, and, and I'm not going to read it because I don't have the time, but in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 6 through 11, uh, there was this shaking in Paul's life, this difficulty that was occurring. Uh, and he said, I, I despaired even of life. You think you and I have problems? These people in Nigeria, they're in northern Nigeria. They're losing their lives by the hundreds. Hundreds. Yeah. And look what's happened in China. Now the Chinese government has said Christianity is illegal. The houses of worship must remove all vestiges of Christianity, and you must worship the prior rulers or the current rulers. It's amazing. So God is wanting us to become stronger. And all of these things Paul said has happened very easily for me to, to share, but it's difficult for him to have endured it. He said, I went through all of this 
God taught me while I was on that threshing floor that I shouldn't be self-reliant. And that goes against the very grain of Americanism. We're taught to be self-reliant. In some respects, we have to be. But he says, I had to learn that the battle is not mine. The battle is the Lord's. The battle against cancer is not yours. It is the Lord's. A battle against low self-esteem is not yours. It is the Lord. The lack of self-confidence in your life is not your battle. It is the Lord's as you call and cry out to him for help in Jesus' glorious name. Then we get to another threshing floor experience. So I want to look at a man who was shaking in his boots. His problem was that he was scared to death. He was a coward. And you know the name of that man, and that was Gideon. Now, you may have heard this story different, but forget all of the other ones that you've heard and listen to me. <laughs> so there is Gideon, and Gideon is threshing wheat. But he's not threshing wheat uh, on a threshing floor. Because that threshing floor, for all you scholars that remembered, is way up on the hill. And people can see you from all around. So what he does is he finds a wine press, and someday you'll see the wine presses that were date back to 2,000 years ago. And they're about this round, maybe a little bigger. So what he did is he took the stalks of wheat, and bam, and bam, and bam, and bam, and bam, and, the, and the grain would drop in there, and he would throw the... Uh, the chaff away or the stalks away. Well, why did he do that? Because he was afraid. He was afraid. He was afraid of the Midianites. And, uh, but when God takes us, meets us at this threshing floor, he comes and he sends his angels and he says, greetings, mighty man of valor. And Gideon says, who are you talking to? I, I, there's nobody here but me. No, it's you. You see, that's how God sees you. It doesn't matter about the education, the experience, your capacity to talk. It doesn't matter about any of these things. What it matters is, is that God sees your heart. And at the threshing floor, it is a place not only where things are separated, but it's a place where God encourages you. Uh, Gideon had a lack of confidence. Do you have a lack of confidence? Lots of people suffer from that. Do you have a sense of insecurity? God wants you to be secure in him. You have feelings of inadequacy. Most people do. God wants you to find your adequacy in him. Now, some of these things can be very difficult, and you may need to go see a Christian psychologist or a Christian psychotherapist to help you walk through this. But God sees the potential in you. We settle, I believe, way less in life than God wants us to settle for. I, it just breaks my heart to see people with incalculable opportunity and giftedness come and embrace mediocrity. When God says, no, if I am with you and if I'm for you, who can be against you? But you've got to shake off those feelings, however it occurs. You've got to shake them off. Shake off those heavy bands. Lift up those holy hands. Let all God's people praise the Lord. You heard that, Brian? Okay. Shake it off. Go to a Christian psychotherapist to help you shake it. Go to a friend. Go to your pastor. In 2 Samuel 6, uh, David desired to bring the Ark of the Covenant to Jerusalem, Yerushalayim. 
And of course, along the way, he builds a new cart, gets two oxen, gets his two friends, one of whom was Uzzah. He said, let's go uh, to Jerusalem. We're marching to Zion. And so they're marching to Zion. They get to the threshing floor. Listen, the threshing floor of Nacon. And there at the threshing floor, the oxen does what? Stumbles. And Uzzah reaches up and he touches the ark. And what happens? He dies. God gave him an early checkout. You're out of here. And why did he do that? And I'll tell you. Because he saw this as a presumptive act that he would touch the holiness of God. You see, David did not follow the prescription of how the ark was to be moved. He just was in a hurry. Just get it done. Let's have a little fun. And so, as a result, uh, he just knew a, a cart. Let's just take it on down the road, bring it to Jerusalem. But if you read in Chronicles what David learned, is that he was not prepared for bringing the ark to Jerusalem. Are you prepared? Am I prepared? Because I'm going to tell you, just between you and me, there's going to be a lot of interesting times ahead. It's nothing to fear, nothing to worry about, but are we prepared? Are we so rooted and grounded in Christ that nothing moves us. Can we stand firm and fear not and expect God to help us? Are we there? And so what happens is David finally realizes after three months that what he had did was completely wrong. He had violated the laws of Moses. He went back. He prepared a tent for the uh, uh, the uh, tabernacle to be placed in, and then he goes back and he brings the Levites. They put the poles through the uh, tabernacle. What am I saying here? And they carry it, the Levites carry it like it was ordained to be carried. See, God has his ways, and you have to follow his ways. And just truth. And sometimes when you're just bumping against the wall, we have to come back and say, well, maybe I'm not doing it his way. Let me share this. Respect for God and his word was restored uh, in this threshing experience. In America today, we experience what I would call casual. Christianity, very casual. And God is calling for a people who will rise up. Rise up, O men of God. Rise up, O women of God. So I need to finish here. Uh, God knows what he's doing, even when things seem out of control. Uh, he is our peace. He is our stability. And that is what we walk in, what we live and trust in. Uh, and that's what God wants us to do. Winston Churchill, uh, when he was leading Britain through the darkest days of the British Empire, daily threatened to be destroyed by the bombs uh, from the Nazis. Uh, he had uh, in his service uh, a young nurse uh, and that nurse stood with him and uh, just listened to what he said. And he taught, her, uh, he, he taught her some very simple things. Uh, he says, calm down. Be anxious for nothing. Calm down. Second thing he taught her, was fear not. Don't be dominated, led. Don't let your imagination run wild. Bring every thought captive. Fear not. Because Churchill believed that God was in control. And then the last one seems out of sync. 
but he taught her contribute. Get your mind off yourself for heaven's sakes and start contributing to the needs of others. Start thinking of ways that you can use your life to be grain, to be a feeding for those who need your help, who need your love, who need your joy, who need your ministry, who need your encouragement, who need your kindness, who need your leadership, who need your presence. In fact, we get to consecration, and I, gee, I've got to finish this quickly. Once again, it's the story of Ruth. Ruth was a Moabitess, and she comes back to Bethlehem Ephratha with Naomi. And so what happens is, is that, she, as it turns out, she ends up in Boaz's field. Boaz was a kinsman redeemer of Naomi. So she's been with him. Boaz has shown Ruth favor. She was one good-looking young lady. Probably about 20 years difference between Boaz and her. And um, so Naomi knew that somehow they had to approach Boaz for her to be redeemed uh, and the, the, the land redeemed. And so what she said is, listen, you go put on some perfume, you know, get some olive oil in your hair and whatever perfume they used that day, I have no idea. Put on your Sunday clothes. And I want you to go down to the threshing floor, and uh, I want you to go there after he's eat, eaten and he's had his wine and lay down at his feet. Now, most people, because we live in a sexualized culture, we start immediately thinking that there is something sexual about this, and I can say with almost 1,000% certainty that there is not. This was a custom. People do things differently than we do. They still do things like this today. So she lays down at his feet. What you need to know is that Boaz is a type of Jesus Christ. Because Boaz is a redeemer, was the redeemer. And so Ruth comes and she lays at his feet. Who else were at the feet of Christ? Mary, Mary. And uh, so she is at Boaz's feet. He wakes up and they converse and she says, in essence, redeem me. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Redeem. I audition every time I get to preach here and Brian never invites me to sing. I, I, I don't know, but I'll let it go. See, it's easy to get in self-pity, isn't it? So what she's saying, and so she represents the body of Christ. She represents you and me coming and asking to be redeemed, to be transformed. So therefore, the threshing floor becomes a place of dedication to God's way. To God's will. Do you have that burning in your heart? I pray that you do. And I pray that I do. And then I'm going to finish with this. Um, I think I'm going to finish with this. Uh, this is what I wrote down. Y y you may not, may not get this, but I'm going to share it anyway. All right? Since you're here. What God is ultimately after is intimacy with Jesus Christ. If you ask any wife in here, what would you most like from your husband? Intimacy. 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 And when we have intimacy with Jesus, difficulties which we will have are surmounted. Sacrifices become pleasures. Sufferings, for God's sake, are honors. Never forget, 
God is too wise to make a mistake. We make some, but God doesn't. He loves you too much. In Jesus' name. Worship team, please. I ask that we finish with singing the days of Elijah. Why would I do that? Well, the reason is, is that Elijah lived in times much like our own. Difficulties, famine, hardships, paganism, people rebelling against God. And yet this song tells us about him and his firmness and his commitment uh, and how he stands firm. And in it, he declares the word of the Lord. Declares the word of the Lord in the hospitals, out on the beach, when you're at the breakers, or at McDonald's, I don't know what your pocketbook is. But wherever it is, will you declare God's word? Will you be a sermon? See, that's what God wants us, all of us, to be a sermon. Okay, worship team, I want you to hit it. And I mean, I want you to hit it, or else I'm coming back up here and and stand with me, please. Let's do it. Put your hands together, church. Sing it for the Lord. And these are the days of Elijah. Declaring the word of the Lord. And these are the days of your servant Moses. Righteousness be restored. just stay up here and play this as people exit. I want some of you to dance out the door. Do you know what I mean? I want you to be like, like Pastor Alex Abiola. Have you ever seen him when he gets going? He's just, and there when he is in uh, Nigeria, I'm telling you, he's just all about it. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord our God 
lift up his countenance and bless you and extend to you his shalom, his peace. Now, go out with joy and be led forth in peace. In Jesus' name, go get them. Amen. Let's do it right now. There's no God. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. There's no God like Jehovah. 